one we're adding to it. Um, to kick us off, I'm pleased that we've got John Baldwin. And he's going to talk about interesting SU2 reps on uh, at least some surgeries on many not. Um, okay. Right, John, take it away. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start by telling you about two theorems. The first has to do with Cavano homology, and uh, the second has to do with fundamental groups of Dane surgeries on knots, as the title suggests. So for the first theorem on Cavano homology, uh, the starting point is actually not fuller homology. So it's pretty well known at this point that Hagard not fuller homology detects uh, the cipher genus. So this is due to Ojoat and Sabo. And it also detects whether a knot is fibered. Uh, and this was this is due to uh, Gijini in the genus one case and um, E in, in the general case. And one upshot of this, an immediate consequence of genus detection, for example, is that knot flow homology uh, detects the unknot. And likewise, an immediate consequence of fiberedness detection, and actually Gijini's result, is that, that it also detects the trefoil and the figure eight. And so this is where things stood uh, at the end of 2006. And it's sort of a natural question whether knot flow homology detects anything else. In particular, does it detect the next simplest knot? And the next simplest knot is the sink foil, also known as the 2-5 torus knot. And uh, I drew a picture of it, or I didn't draw a picture of it. Here's a picture of it from the first slide. On the right, that's the sink foil. And well, when you start thinking about it, well, if, if the knot flow homology of a knot K agrees with that of T25, then you can say that the knot K is genus two, it's fibered, it's strongly quasi-positive, and it has the same Alexander polynomial as T25. The difficulty though, is that there are infinitely many knots that meet that criteria. And it's not an infinite list that is, you can sort of approach systematically, or at least as far as I can tell. So it's hard to know how to get a foothold into this problem. Uh, but this is the question that Stephen and Ying and I started thinking about in the spring. And we made some progress, we didn't solve it, but we were able to make enough progress actually to prove the first theorem I'll talk about, that Cavano homology detects uh, this, this torus knot. Over the two element field. And I'll explain later why um, the two element field is important. So this was supposed to be actually one of the main application of the, the not floor detection result, um, but we were able to prove this somehow instead of the not floor detection result. And this is a little bit strange because in the proof that Cavano homology detects the unknot and the trefoil, you rely on the fact that some floor homology theory does. So here we're in a sort of strange situation. And actually, it's curious, T25 is now the, it's the only knot, or I think link, um, where Cavano homology, but not some floor theory, uh, is known to detect it. And the other thing I'll mention is that, you know, with, with the unknot and the trefoil, it's an open question whether the Jones polynomial detects those knots. Um, but for the T25, it's known that the Jones polynomial doesn't detect it. And uh, so the knot 10132, for example, has the same Jones polynomial as T25. So that's the first theorem about Cavano homology. The second theorem has to do with fundamental groups. And one way to talk about how complicated the fundamental group or any group is, is to ask how far is this group from being, let's say, abelian. And one way to, to study that question is to study um, representations, homomorphisms from your group into other non-abelian groups. And so that motivates the following definition. So we say that a three manifold is SU2 abelian If 
every homomorphism from the fundamental group to SU2 has abelian image. And I should say that the classification of SU2 abelian manifolds is hard. Uh, in fact, one of the famous Kirby problems, which is also a generalization of the Poincaré conjecture, says that, or asks whether S3 is the only homology sphere that's SU2 abelian. Uh, I should say there's been recent work on, on this for toroidal manifolds uh, due to Lidman, Kinzon, Caicedo, and, and Rafael Zener. Um, so the classification of SU2 abelian manifolds is, is hard, even for, for surgeries on knots. Um, but there's a, the most well-known result along those lines is due to Kronheimer and Rufka and comes from their work on the property P conjecture. So if K is a non-trivial knot, then our surgery on K is not SU2 abelian. When, so not SU2 abelian, meaning that there is an irreducible or non-abelian representation when R equals one. So that was the first thing Kronheimer and Rufka proved in 2004. In particular, one surgery on a non-trivial knot is not a homotopy sphere. And that was enough for property P by the cyclic surgery theorem. So in a companion paper the same year, they proved the same thing is true for all rational slopes in the, uh, in the interval from zero to two. And then, you know, it's a natural question, what, how far you can extend this. Is this also true for larger values of R? And if you think about it for a second, you realize that it fails for R equals five because five surgery on the right-handed trefoil, for example, is a lens space, which has a Belian fundamental group. And so led by that, Kronheimer and Rivka asked whether the same is true for the next two integers, r equals three and, and four. And a couple years ago, Stephen and I proved that it does indeed hold when r equals four. This followed from some long paper on instanton flow homology. Uh, but the, four, the R equals four case, we were able to handle with, with a special trick. So the theorem that I want to talk, the, the other theorem that I want to mention, theorem B, uh, and this is joint work with Jen Kun Lee, Stephen, and Fan Ye, who's on the job market. And it appeared on the archive yesterday, is that is um, answering the remaining half of Kronheimer and Riff's question. So we, we show that Three surgery on a knot is not SU2 billion uh, when K is non trivial. And I should say that, you know, we, we also, in the course of the work, prove, that, prove the same thing for infinitely many slopes, infinitely many other slopes um, in the interval from three to five. Okay. So, that's the second theorem. And while these two theorems might look somewhat different, they're united by a common problem, which is to understand genus two instanton L space knots in both the Hagard and instanton four settings. So let me just remind you what I mean by that. So we say that a knot K is an L space knot. So that means that some surgery on K is an L space. So in particular, if the dimension uh, of the Hagard floor homology, let's say, of R surgery on K equals R uh, for some R bigger than zero. And there's a similar notion for instanton floor homology. So you can define instanton L spaces as well. And one thing that's known about L spaces is that they're, uh, or L space knots, space knots is that they're both fibered and strongly quasi-positive. So strongly quasi-positive means that, well, there's a fibered knot, so it corresponds to an open book and therefore a context structure. Strongly quasi-positive, one way to think about that is that it means the corresponding context structure is tight. So this, is, this result was proven by a combination of works of Ojvat and Sabo, Matt Hedden, and Ian Yee in the Hagard 4 setting 
and then um, by myself and Stephen uh, much later uh, in the instant on floor setting. And the other thing I'll remark is that um, K is a genus two L space knot, at least in the Hagard floor setting. That's the same as saying that the knot floor homology of K agrees with the knot floor homology of T25. So the classification of genus two L space knots is really the same as um, the question of as trying to as the classification of knots with the same knot floor homology as T25. That's how those questions are, are related. And so if you conjecture that knot floor homology detects T25, you might also conjecture that the only genus two L space knot is T25. So what we show, and this is the third major theorem in the paper. And this is, uh, so we proved this in the Hagard floor setting. That was joint work with uh, Ying and Stephen. And very recently in the instanton floor setting, we proved the same thing with uh, Zhen Kun and, and Fan. And it says that, well, if K is um, not T25, and it's a genus two, L space knot in either the Hagard floor or, or instanton settings, then it's of a special form. So there exists a uh, pseudo Anasov five braid beta such that, well, first uh, the closure of beta is an unknot. So I'll denote the closure of beta by B. And, and second, K, the knot K we're interested in, is equal to the lift of the braid axis uh, to, the, to the branch double cover uh, of B. So I'll denote that by so the branch double cover of S3 along B. And since B is an unknot, this is just the three sphere. <laughs> okay. So somewhat complicated uh, theorem statement. Let me show you a picture, which hopefully will make this a little bit clearer. So let me copy this. So, okay, let's focus on the picture on the left. So here we have this five braid beta whose closure is this knot B, which is the unknot. And, uh, and K is the lift of this axis, A, in the branch double cover of B. That's what we prove. Um, there's another way, so there's another way of thinking about this, right? The other way of thinking about this is that K, well, there's an involution of S3 uh, that fixes the knot K. And the quotient of K under that involution is this unknotted axis A. So in particular, we see that K is doubly periodic with um, unknotted quotient given by this axis A. And here's a picture that, that um, illustrates that. So, you know, because B is an unknot, right? We can view B as, as an axis. And A is some knot that runs through B some number of times. Now, A doesn't have to be a braid here. It's just some knot. And what we're saying is this shows that, that actually the knot K is this knot. It's doubly periodic and its quotient is precisely the unknot A. So that's what we prove. And uh, a couple of days after we, we posted this paper, uh, Yi posted a paper using this result uh, to prove, Yi and uh, Zhang, to prove um, results about characterizing slopes for T25, which was really interesting. 
Uh, I should say another thing that didn't actually go into this paper with Ying Hu is that it follows from this result that, for example, genus two knots don't have prism manifold surgeries. So there are other things um, you can sort of immediately derive from, from this theorem. John, does T25 fit into this framework in some degenerate way? Yeah, T25 is also a doubly periodic knot, right? Where B is just this, um, in this case, it's just a very a simple braid, like sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, sigma four. Right, okay. <laughs> okay. So what I wanna do is I wanna explain the proof of this theorem, C, and then I wanna explain how, how we use it to prove the Kavanaugh result, theorem A. And if you're interested in knowing how the, uh, the, the other theorem, theorem B follows in the instanton setting, you can, you can ask me after. Okay. So, proof of theorem C. All right, so remember that, what are we assuming? We're assuming that K is a genus two L space knot. And what I said before is that implies in the Hagard force setting, for example, that K is fibered and strongly quasi-positive. Okay. And again, because it's fibered, we can represent the vibration by some abstract open book. So some surface with boundary H and some uh, uh, some boundary fixing homo diffeomorphism H. Surface with boundary S and uh, homo uh, diffeomorphism H, which is the identity on the boundary of S. And so this is an open book actually for um, the three sphere, but actually it's for the tight contact three sphere. And that's from the fact that the, the not K is strongly quasi-positive tightness. So we're assuming that K is not T25. And um, well, that, that implies it's easy to show that it's not any torus knot. You can also show that it's not a satellite knot, just from an Alexander polynomial argument. So actually, we know that K is hyperbolic. And what that implies by work of Thurston is that this monodromy is freely isotopic uh, to a pseudo Nasov homeomorphism psi of the surface S. And what is a pseudo and also homeomorphism? Well, by the Thurston-Nielsen classification, um, homeomorphisms are either periodic, reducible, or pseudo Nasov. So it's just a homeomorphism that's not periodic or reducible, meaning that no power of it is the identity and it doesn't fix some multi-curve on the surface. All right, well, maybe that's, that's not, there's another characterization of uh, pseudo Nasov maps, which are, which are more geometric. And that is that a pseudo Nasov homeomorphism fixes a pair of transverse singular foliations on the surface. All right, so let me show you a picture of what that looks like. So these, these singular foliations, <clears throat> so one, one of them is blue and the other is red. Um, they each have measures and the, the homeomorphism expands the measure on one and contracts it on the other by the same factor. Uh, I said these are singular foliations and uh, what do the singularities look like? Well, in the interior of the surface, they, they're modeled on um, n-pronged singularities where n, <clears throat> excuse me, is at least three. And they look the same, <clears throat> they look similar in a neighborhood of the boundary. So here in this picture on the left, this is what the foliations look like, say, in a neighborhood of the boundary, oops, the boundary of the surface. So <clears throat> they, they meet the, the boundary of the surface in these, in these prongs, you see. And unlike in the interior, they can meet the surface, these prongs can meet the surface in the boundary in, <clears throat> in one prong. So you can have one prong boundaries, actually. So what I've drawn here is an example where the number of prongs, which I'll denote by n, is, is three for each of these two foliations. So this is, um, these are the, supposed to be the invariant foliations for, for Psi, the pseudo Nasov map. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so there's a quantity now that you can associate to uh, 
this homeomorph the diffeomorphism H, the monodrome may be a fibered knot. So H is the identity on the boundary of the surface, whereas psi, it it leaves, uh, it fixes each of these foliations. So what that means is it has to send boundary prongs to boundary prongs, okay? So what you can do is you can measure how much twisting happens near the boundary in the free isotopy between H and its pseudo Nasov representative. And that measure of twisting is what's called the fractional Dane twist coefficient of the monodromy. And that's some fraction, it's some K divided by N, where N is the number of boundary prongs. And uh, because we know that this context structure is tight, the result of Honda Kazez and Madic tells us that this has to be bigger than zero. And actually, we also know by a result of Rachel Roberts that it has to be less than one, because if it were one or greater, then the corresponding manifold would have a top foliation, but S3 doesn't have a top foliation. So we know the twist coefficient is bounded between zero and one. And that implies that actually the number of boundary prongs N has to be greater than or equal to two. <laughs> can't be one. You can't have one prong boundary in this case. And the reason that's so important is because it means that you can then cap off. You can cap off the boundary. And because the boundary has more than one prong, you can extend these singular foliations to a singularity in the interior of the capped off surface, S hat. So S hat is this capped off genus two surface now, closed genus two surface. You can extend um, these foliations so that they become invariant foliations for the resulting pseudo Nasov map on this closed genus two surface. And what you see is that the boundary collapses to a fixed point. So this is a fixed point of psi hat, which we'll call P for point, I guess. Okay. So, so this is what we learn. Um, if K is a genus two in L space knot that's not the torus knot. And from here, one of the new things we did is we used a relationship between Hagard floor homology and periodic floor homology to study <clears throat> more about this monodromy. So let me describe that. So this is a theorem, a hard theorem, due to Leontalb's <clears throat> and um, also Kutlahan Leontalb's. as part of the proof that uh, monopole floor homology is isomorphic to Hagard floor homology. So what they say is this, they say, suppose uh, sigma is a closed uh, surface of genus at least three. And we have some uh, area form on the surface, let's say, and uh, an area preserving diffeomorphism of the surface phi. Then what they say is that the Hagard floor homology, so we can, we can now consider this mapping torus, the mapping torus of phi, we'll denote like this. So this is the, the mapping torus. The Hagard floor homology of this mapping torus in a certain spin C structure, which is, I'll call top minus one. So it's a, sort of the, the next to top non-zero spin C structure, is isomorphic to the symplectic floor homology of, <clears throat> of this, this diffeomorphism. And what is a symplectic floor homology? Well, I don't want to really explain much about it, except that it's the, it's the floor, it comes from the homology of a chain complex where the chain complex is uh, generated by fixed points of, um, of the diffeomorphism. So really these fixed points correspond to orbits in the mapping torus 
And those are really the generators. And the differential counts holomorphic cylinders between such orbits and the symplectization of the mapping tools. Okay. So we want to apply that. We want to apply that to, to the example at hand. Uh, we have this closed surface and this pseudo NASA of map, but our closed surface has genus two, and this applies only in, in genus three or bigger. And so the idea we had was to try to apply this uh, not, to, not to zero surgery on the knot, which would be the mapping torus of psi hat, but to zero surgery on the connected sum of K and its, and its mirror. So one way to think about that, that zero surgery is that you have your genus two surface with the diffeomorphism H, so this is S, and uh, zero surgery on the connected sum Take another copy of the surface. It's, it's the mapping torus of the map, which is H on one side and, and H on the other, where you're viewing the other surface with its opposite orientation. So now this is a genus four surface, and we can apply um, this, this theorem I've been talking about. If only we can calculate the Hagard floor homology of zero surgery on this connected sum. Well, see, we said that, you know, if K is a genus two L space knot, then it has the same knot floor homology as T25. And so the, the connected sum of K and its, its mirror has the same knot floor homology as the connected sum of T25 and its mirror. And uh, the knot floor homology of that connected sum is, is thin. And so from just from the not floor homology, you can compute the floor homology of the zero surgery by the, the, the integer surgery formula in floor homology. And when you do this for T25, connect some its mirror, you see that that's equal to zero. And so what that implies is that the symplectic floor homology of this diffeomorphism on the genus four surface is trivial. And there's some really nice work of Andy Cotton Clay which um, allows you to compute the symplectic floor homology of any surface diffeomorphism, as long as you put that into a special form. And the really interesting, nice thing he proves is that you can compute it from some complex where the differential is just zero on the nose. And so the floor homology is just the number of fixed points on the nose. And so the upshot of this, so using Cotton Clay's work, we prove that Psi has no fixed points. So remember that Psi was the pseudo NASA of map that was isotopic to our monodromy H, okay? It has no fixed points. And I should say that in another paper shortly after we posted this, uh, Yin Yi um, extended this idea to show that L space knots of any genus um, their monodromies, or at least their pseudo NASA representatives, if they're hyperbolic, have no fixed points. It's the same idea. But the interesting thing for us is that this implies, you see, remember, we, we were able to extend Psi uh, to the capped off genus two surface. And what it implies about that is that this capped off Psi has only one fixed point, right? It's this point P here in the middle. Okay. So is everyone with me so far? Okay, good. Um, all right. Now, how is that useful? Well, so we have this closed genus two surface. We have this diffeomorphism psi hat, and it has just this one fixed point. Well, genus two surfaces are hyperliptic. What that means is that the mapping class group has non-trivial center. Uh, in other words, there is this hyperliptic involution of the genus two surface, which commutes up to isotopy with any other diffeomorphism. And actually you can arrange on the nose, I mean, you can arrange that, that this involution commutes with this map psi hat on the nose. So there exists an involution, tau of this capped off genus two surface, such that 
um, tau commutes with this map psi hat. And why is that important? Well, so we can think about what tau does to this fixed point P. And I claim that tau leaves P fixed. So P is a fixed point of psi hat. It's also a fixed point of tau. The way we show that, right? Tau of P, well, P is, P is fixed by psi hat. So it's the same as psi hat of P. And by commutivity, that's the same as psi hat of, of tau of P. And so what you see is that tau of P is also fixed by the map psi hat. But psi hat, we just proved, has one fixed point. And so that shows that tau of P is equal to P. Okay, so P is fixed by this involution. And that allows you to do something really nice. Here's the relevant picture. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the capped off surface S and, and this is sort of a picture of, of the involution, right? Your sphere get along this axis. And because you know that the involution fixes P, actually what you can show is that um, tau commutes with the surface you get from puncturing at P, name, uh, with, with, the, with the induced map on that surface, namely with the monodromy H. So we have this monodromy H of the genus two surface and the genus two surface of boundary is not hyperelliptic. But in this case, you can show that there's this involution tau that commutes with H. It's very special. And uh, what it implies, well, so you can then take the quotient of this entire open book by this involution and you just get an open book where the page is a disc and there are five branch points. So you get an open book for S3 branched along a five braid. So the quotient uh, is a five braid. Beta. Okay, so that's the proof of theorem C. That's it. So we use the fact that there was one fixed point to show that um, the monodromy H commutes with this involution. That was the key. All right, so I wanna now explain how we use this to prove the detection result for Kavanaugh homology. So here, you know, suppose, so we're trying to show that Kavana homology detects T25. So suppose we have a knot whose reduced Kavana homology, so it's enough to work with reduced, is the same as that, as that of T25 over uh, the two element field. And let's suppose that K is not equal to T25 and try to reach a contradiction. So in particular, um, This is five dimensional. The Kavanaugh homology is five dimensional. All right. Well, one thing that you can conclude right away, not right away, uh, is that the knot floor homology of K is isomorphic to the knot floor homology of, of T25, uh, at least over Q. So this, is, this comes from Nate Dowland's spectral sequence relating Kavanaugh homology and knot floor homology. And, and we, this was proved in a paper uh, that I wrote with, with Nate, Adam Levine, Ty Lidman, um, and Radmila uh, Sazdanovich. I think in 2020. <laughs> okay. And so in particular, that shows that K is a, a genus two L space knot. Okay, because as I remarked earlier, these two things are equivalent. And then, so we can apply our theorem C and we know that K is the lift of uh, some axis, the braid axis, A, in the branch double cover of S3 along, along this unknot. So let me just remind you, uh, let me grab this picture again.
So that was the output of theorem C. Is everyone with me? That sound good? Okay. And so, you know, here's, here's A, right? Again, uh, here's our unknot B. Uh, well, what you could do, you know, is you could try to say, well, we know B is an unknot, it's a fibrate, it's pseudo nasa fibrate. Um, can we classify it? Well, the problem is there are infinitely many conjugacy classes of, of fibrate representatives of the unknot. So that's hard. And you can say, well, actually, we know a little bit more. So from the proof of theorem C, we can actually, we can actually get more information about H. So for example, we can show that there are actually four boundary prongs. The fractional Dane twist coefficient is one fourth. And then there are two three pronged singularities in the interior that are swapped by the monodromy, and there are no other fixed points. So that's that's pretty restrictive, and you can try to use that to to narrow down what what this braid can possibly be. And we did that for a while, and we were sort of reading and learning about train track automata and, and things like that. Uh, but it seemed hard, at least for someone with my expertise. We weren't able to do it. Uh, so then you you know you're stuck. We were stuck for a while, um, and at some point we remembered that, well, you know, it would be really nice. So we have this dual picture, right? B is an unknot, right? And so we can sort of draw A with respect to this unknot B. If you could somehow show that A, so we know that B is braided about A. If you could somehow also show that A is braided about B, that would be really nice because A and B would then be what are called mutually braided unknots. And you remember back when you were thinking about something else that had nothing to do with this work that the mutually braided unknots are really special. And so maybe that restricts this, that ought to restrict the search space. And that's indeed what we do. So the idea was, and the insight was to try to show that A is also braided about B. I'll write that down. In other words, um, that B, that beta is what's called an exchangeable braid. So how do you show that something is, is braided? Well, this is when you remember, you think about all the different invariants you know about. Uh, there are floor homological invariants that can show things are braided, uh, but you want something which makes a connection with things that you know. For, you know we know something about the Kavana homology of our knot, for example. And then you remember that annular Kavano homology can be used to show that things are braided. So what's annular Kavano homology? Annular Kavano homology is an invariant of links in a solid torus. And uh, we naturally have here a link in a solid torus. So A defines a link in, a, in the solid torus, which is just the complement of B. Okay, we wanna show that A here is braided with respect to B. And so, Maybe if we understood the annular Kavanaugh homology of A, we could do that. Well, we know something about the Kavanaugh homology of the knot K. We want to know something about the annular Kavanaugh homology of this knot A. So then there's this very nice paper by Matt Stoffergen and Melissa Jean which uses the lipschitz uh, sharkar homotopy type to prove a Smith-type um, inequality. Relating the Kavanaugh homology of the knot K, which is doubly periodic, with the annular Kavanaugh homology of the quotient knot A. So what, what their result says is the dimension of the Kavanaugh homology unreduced of K is greater than or equal to the dimension of the annular Kavanaugh homology. <laughs> and this only works over the two element field, right? This is a two periodic knot, Smith inequality applies over Z mod two Z. And that's ultimately why our main result about Kavanaugh detection is also uh, mod two. <laughs> um, Okay. Well, we know that the reduced Kavanaugh homology has rank five. And so 
unreduced is just two copies of the reduced over the two element field. So this has dimension 10. And so that bounds the dimension of annular Kavana homology. It's 10 dimensional. To show that A is braided, we need to show that the dimension in the top annular grading is one. All right, so, but, and, uh, and that actually only works over the complex coefficients. So this tells you in particular by the universal coefficient theorem that the dimension over the complex numbers of annular Kavana homology is at most 10. And we know something else. We also know that uh, the dimension, so annular Kavana homology is this extra grading uh, coming from its embedding in the solid torus. And what we know is that um, the dimension of annular Kavana homology is non in, is non zero uh, for some annular grading i, which is at least the linking number of a and b, which is in this case five. And and this comes from this is a result of Yi Jia and Bo Yu Zhang. And it comes from relating annular Kavana homology to an annular version of, of instant on floor homology. So that's what we know. And to show, again, like I said, to show that A is braided with respect to B, what you have to do is you have to show that in the top annular grading, uh, the annular Kavana homology has rank one. So, so how do we do that? Well, that's when you, so, so we, can, we can think about these annular Kavana groups. And, uh, in this case, they're all supported in, in odd uh, annular gratings. So the smallest one is one and then three. And annular Kavana homology is, has this symmetry with respect to taking the negative of the annular grating. That's why I'm writing it like this. And um, well, we're working over the complex numbers now and there's actually an SL2C action. on annular Kavana homology. This is due to Grigsby, Licata, and Verley. So they, they define this SL2C action where the weight space corresponds to the annular grading. So in particular, you have these, you know, I have the, these lowering, you have these lowering operators, let's say call them E. If you know something about SL2C, this will make sense. Otherwise, maybe it won't. And you have these raising operators, F. And one really interesting consequence of having an SL2C action is that you get this uh, trapezoidality or unimodality of dimensions. So we know that, in other words, the dimension of annular Kravana homology increases as we go in toward the middle annular gratings from the, the outer ones. Okay, well, remember that we, we said on the previous page that annular Kravana homology, it's non-trivial in some grading that's at least five. And actually what we can conclude from that is that whatever the top grading is, the annular Kavana homology in that top grading is one dimensional. And the way we see that is suppose it, suppose it were at least two dimensional, right? Then because these dimensions increase, if this were bigger than one dimensional, right? Then all of these other ones would have to be bigger than one dimensional, but there are at least six of them. And so that would say that the total dimension of annular Kavana homology is at least 12, but we bounded it by 10. Right, so a combination of the Stafford Zhang Smith type inequality from Kavanov, the Kavanov homotopy type, together with the SL2C action, tells you that in the top grading, annular Kavanov homology is one dimensional, and uh, and that in particular that tells you that A is braided with respect to B.
And again, this comes from a spectral sequence uh, relating annular cavanophomology to instant homology. And in fact, you, you know, since it has linking number five and it's braided, it's actually a five braid. So the top grading is five, although that's not so important. All right. So that's uh, that's the proof of this of this key idea, this claim. So now we know that A and B are mutually braided unknots. And mutually braided unknots were studied a long time ago by Morton. And what Morton proved, he proved since, since A and B, which is the closure of this sprayed beta, are mutually braided unknots, um, beta has to be of a special form. Beta, in this case, is uh, what's called a Stallings braid. And in fact, because it's a fibrate, it's a Stallings fibrate. Okay. And what does that mean? So this is due to Morton, a long while back. And what that means is that beta is a product of uh, positive and negative bands. So, um, let's see, sigma ij. So I'll show you what a picture looks like. Okay, so uh, this is a five braid, and this is one of the generators. So sigma one four. So you see, it's a it's a positive band between the first and fourth strands. Okay, the crosses in front of the rest of the braid. So Morton says that if if A and B are mutually braided unknots, then then beta has to be a Stallings five braid. So it's a product of four of these bands, and and you know they can be positive or negative. Not all such things result in mutually braided unknots, but it has to be of this type if it is, if these are mutually braided unknots. Uh, we can actually show that um, you only need to consider positive bands. And that, that comes, that goes back to the tightness of the, the context structure associated decay. So, well, there are finitely many of these braids, right? I mean, how many of these generators are there? Uh, there are five strands, we're choosing two of them. So five choose two is 10. So there are 10 generators and we're a product of four of the generators. So there are at most 10,000 such braids that we have to think about. <laughs> and um, well, now you can use SnapP and other computer programs to, to help you with the problem. And what you, what you see is that, what you learn is that only five of these up to conjugacy are pseudo Nasov. And such that the lift of the braid axis, K, has the same Alexander polynomial as T25. <laughs> okay. And so then what's interesting, so there are these five braids you have to consider essentially now. And um, so it turns out that these five braids, these five, five braids, produce the same knot. So their braid axes lift, oops, to the same knot. And it looks like this, I'll show you a picture. Oops. Looks like this, so I'll paste it in here. <sighs> okay, so it's a nasty looking knot which looks pretty evidently like, not like, well, looks, looks weird. Um, and so now you just compute, I say just, you compute, it's not full homology, using a program uh, written by Zoltan Sabo. And what you see is that the not full homology of K is, is not the not full homology of T25. And that's a contradiction. And that's the proof of 
of the theorem A. And um, I should say, so this is, you know, using, using Sabo's program for computing not floor homology. Um, and you could do it for complicated knots because it's based on this sort of bordered construction that they have for computing not floor homology. So it runs really quickly. So following in the, in the tradition uh, started by Siddhi Krishna, who uh, you know, coined the term trefail for this knot. And uh, the term figure ain't, maybe that was due to Stephen for this knot. That's Stephen. due to Josh. Oh, due to Josh, Josh yeah. Green? Okay. <laughs> the figure ain't due to Josh Green, the trefail, trefail due to city. Figure ain't. Um, Stephen calls this knot the, the stink foil. Oops, I think I'm supposed to spell it with a Q. Okay. Um, but he's actually lately taken to calling it the, the kitchen uh, sink foil as well, because we sort of threw the whole the kitchen sink at this problem. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's all I really wanted to talk about. Uh, and I'm happy to say more about the instant time side of the story and, and theorem B if people have questions. Well, that was lovely. We'll let people pitch in questions. So the kitchen sink foil is better even though the stink foil is really great. Just because one of these is gonna stick. So I'm just, okay. I'm just telling you which one to push. I'm, this is the most important thing you can get out of giving this talk, John. I, I agree with, with Liam on, on that. I mean, it, yes. it's not like it stinks. It's actually quite an amazing knot. I mean, you'll have to take it up with Steve. You know, like he's, yeah. that's his job. Yeah, I, I would say that as a Taurus knot, it stinks. But as a different kind of knot, sure, it's nice. Oh, that's awesome. That, that's true, Stephen. It's super bad at being a Taurus knot. You can set up a pole on Zoom. I'm just saying. <laughs> I like it. I mean, but Tom, you know, Tom says so. <laughs> yeah, Tom says so. Feels like exactly. And Tom says so. so. That decided it, didn't it? <laughs> but, you know, I have to say this reminds me a bit of what many thousands of years ago when I gave a talk about uh, Peter and I, our first proof of property P. Um, at the end of the talk, Gromov looked at me very grumpily and said, but isn't there a simpler proof? <laughs> and I'm just, you know, I wish I could channel him. <laughs> yeah i mean it's um, fantastic i mean you really did throw like you said the kitchen sink that's a good it. It, it, and, uh, is, is there and, a simple uh, i mean you know we we really wanted to we spent a long time uh thinking hard about whether we could actually just understand what what the braid had to be you know from what we knew about it monodrumming um i think it's a hard problem yeah uh, sure i mean I mean, we really tried. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not really, you know, I'm just, you know, somebody criticized one of my complicated proofs. I'm just kind of sharing that pain now with you. you no, know? Okay. So it was, it was annoying. I thought it was a great proof at the time. I was very happy <laughs> <laughs> and was quite a, displeased that he, he threw shade on it. This is so great that this proof can just help you with that trauma, Tom. Yeah, no, I, it, it is. I mean, I, I feel, you know, you need to work through these things slowly and years of therapy. And uh, now I feel complete. Thanks, John yeah, well, and Stephen. Yeah, that's a great paper. There's so many reasons. That's amazing. Thanks. I think I learned more in this talk, more different things in this talk than I have in quite a while. What was the goal? Um, oh, yeah. Go ahead. I, I was just going to ask, like, I, I don't know how to turn this into a, 
a, a concrete question, but I, I guess the, since we just talked about therapy, the feelings way of asking it would be like, what does this make you think about detection for not floor homology? Like, do you, does any part of the story feel like if you could only track this or that? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, there, there were, so it's interesting that Kavanaugh homology, you can prove that that detects a knot that not floor homology doesn't, right? And uh, the key things are, well, this the Smith type inequality uh, that comes from the Kavanaugh homotopy type. So, you know, now there's maybe a not floor homotopy type. We don't know that it's an invariant of knots yet. Uh, so conceivably, one could prove something similar with that. And then the other thing we used which seems quite special to Kavanaugh homology is this SL2C action, which gave us the, the, the unimodality of these dimensions. And um, yeah, I don't know if, if one should expect there to be any analog in, on the not floor side. I mean, the more natural quantum group is GL11, UQ GL11 uh, there. And knowing that you have a GL11 representation doesn't tell you, doesn't give you any sort of unimodality result. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you know, you'd be able to mimic this on, on the not floor side sort of strange. Thanks. Maybe, um, maybe I should throw in that the one thing that, that we've talked about how it would be nice to have and seems to be folklore that hasn't been proved is that what what is what is HF plus of zero surgery in the lower spin C structures? Like those should detect, um, you know, fixed points of symmetric powers of the monodromy or something, but we don't, we don't know that. So we're kind of stuck on it. I'm not supposed to say that out loud. <laughs> you know, it, one of these days, Paolo and whoever else is working on this is going to put out that paper anyway, we hope. So I, I want them to put it out. So it, maybe if we pressure them publicly, it'll happen. Good point. Then they'll need therapy. So maybe I'll mention also uh, something about the instanton side. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, um, this, this theorem C, on the Higgard floor side, we used this uh, relationship between Higgard floor homology and uh, the symplectic floor homology of the diffeomorphism. And that holds for surfaces of genus greater than or equal to three. There's something similar on the instanton floor side. So there's, so it's been known for a while by Dostoglu and Solomon, that there's a relationship between some version of instanton floor homology of the mapping torus and the symplectic floor homology of the induced map on a character variety. <laughs> Now, Ivan Smith proved that, that actually when, when the genus of your surface is exactly two, um, you actually get a relationship between instanton floor homology and the symplectic floor homology of this, the diffeomorphism of your surface. Um, and that only works for genus two. So this, this Higgard floor theorem works for genus greater than or equal to three, and that the other the instanton version works for genus two. And I don't understand that. It's, it's, uh, it seems to be complicated. I mean, I think Ivan, Ivan proved it using by first proving some equivalence of Fukaya categories that that was motivated by homological mirror symmetry and some equivalence of derived categories of sheaves uh, in his paper on, on the pencil of quadrics. So anyway, 